502. Sorry, Marty. Um, you can text me. We're going to call the meeting to order. The this is the legislative today. matters meeting. I'm in the Bill White. I'm the chair of this committee, for better or for worse. And um, I apologize. I wasn't here at the last one, but I've done a lot of catch up since. So we're going to do a continuation of a hearing uh, in a little bit. But first, um, Laura, would you call the roll of the committee, please? Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Carney. Councilor Klein. Here. And Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Murphy. Here. Here. Yeah, Councilor Carney is absent with excuse. Um, all right, so we are convened. We have a quorum, so we can, we can move on. Um, first up, we proceed each meeting. Uh, first with an announcement to let you know that this the proceedings are being recorded audio and visually. Um, and that's so you can have informed consent. Uh, and then we do public comment. And uh, well, I have a sign-up sheet here, but that's these people, uh, other folks are not excluded from uh, speaking once we clear the sheet. So just so you know, if you didn't get the sign-up, don't worry. First up, Willie Lombard. And, and when you come up, please just uh, give us your name and what town you live in. We'll forego the address part. Okay. Hi everybody, I'm Lily Lombard, Northampton. Um, I, I just have a more of a procedural question. I know that you're doing a continuation of the hearing on the draft ordinance. My comments are directly related to that and um, it I benefited greatly last time when we heard Carolyn make her presentation about the latest version of the draft before we made comments of it, it contextualizing it for the folks behind me as well as allows me not to have to explain things to you that you're not familiar yet with so would you prefer that I hold my comments yeah Lily I think because of the public comment part we don't exchange we don't give and exactly. take and I think during the hearing that that's what lend itself to a conversation great okay so, just a point this isn't a meeting this is a hearing yeah so that's and if the difference between a meeting and a hearing is during a meeting you have no right to speak during a uh, a meeting you have no right to speak during a hearing you have a right to be heard so right. it makes sense for you to be so we, when we go into the hearing that would make more sense right now this is just a public comment on, on okay uh is that true of everyone else on this list who is uh david reitman did you want to what do you think i've got bill's comments do you think uh, i think it makes sense to wait for the, wait. the hearing conversation. Okay. uh adele yes I'd, i'll wait You'll wait too. Uh, Kit? Well, Kim? Should I wait? Kit said, yeah. Kit, I, yeah. I'll, I'll wait too. Unless right. anyone no, has Helen. to rush away. I'll wait. Everyone's going to wait. Anyone else? Anyone want to speak on any other topic? <laughs> no. Okay. So we seem to be topic singular here, so we'll, we'll move on then. Uh, so, uh, first up, and the first item is the approval of the minutes of the Previous meeting from February 11, 2019. Move to approve the minutes from February 11. And I will second that. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of accepting the minutes as they are written, please say aye. 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 Okay. All right. So, um, what's the process of an reopening hearing? It's just we need to put it on the floor then, or right. do, yeah. Okay. So, is there a motion? I move we reopen the hearing. Is there a second? There is a second. Okay. All those in favor of reopening the hearing, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, this, we are reopening the hearing. This is uh, relative to item 18.231. This is an ordinance relative to large scale ground mounted solar arrays. And as you said, it's a continuation of the public hearing from February 11th, 2019. The history on this, it's been referred to legislative matters and the planning board is a joint hearing that was on January. 17th, the joint public hearing was held, as we said, on February 11th. An alternate version was proposed by the Public uh, Trade uh, Shade Tree <laughs> Committee, and then the Planning Board opted for its own amendments, positively recommended an ordinance as amended, which is before force today, on uh, March 28, 2019. And then the, in that context, the Public Shade Tree Committee endorsement was withdrawn. Um, so the process for this is usually proponents. We uh, get to speak. Opponents or people who are neutral get to speak. 
but I'm sort of guessing, well, let's, Carolyn, why don't we have you represent the proponents and you get to speak first. How's that? Counselor, because yeah. um, we have an amended version here. I wonder if we actually need to. You want, yeah, okay. Let me, that's fair. I will, uh, I will read you the amended version as it stands, as this is what we are deliberating at this point. And uh, this is upon the recommendation of the mayor and then what, what struck was and public trade uh, shade tree committee. Uh, an ordinance relative to large scale ground mounted solar arrays is an ordinance yours, of the city of Northampton. And it is um, to be a, um, amended by modifying allowances <coughs> under permit for ground mounted solar photovoltaic arrays. Um, use is allowed by right. Um, now our, our uh, I want to avoid using um, acronyms here. So, um, Thank you. <laughs> yes. well, that that's the, this is, but the, the we have rural residential, special residential SR, suburban, suburban residential, uh, urban residential, residential area. area. Uh, urban residential business. B. No, just B. A, B, C. B, right. A, B, and C. That's right. That's, okay. Thank you very much. And then we also have urban residential C. And then wetlands. No. What's Water that? supply protection. Oh, plus. Water supply protection. Zoning districts. And then for water supply uh, uh, protection districts to lead from uses allowed by special permits. Rooftop solar hot water and photovoltaic. Uh, accessory solo, uh, solar photovoltaic PV ground mounted on a parcel with any building slash use, provided that the PV is sized to generate no more than 200% of the annual projected electric use of the non-PV uh, building slash use, or tel uh, 12 kilowatts, whichever is greater. The setbacks <coughs> for such a PV shall be the same as for the detached accessory structures as set forth in the table above, which is not included on this. Um, and so, so, so also part of the amended language is move from uses allowed by special permit to uses allowed by right. <laughs> oh, I, I forgot. Industrial, general the office district. industrial, general industrial, and, and, central, and central business districts. Accessory uh, solar uh, photovoltaic ground mounted on a parcel with any building in use, provided that the PV is sized to generate no more than 200% of the annual projected electric use of the non-PV building or use, and delete from the uh, delete the following from all districts. And what has been struck has been the administrative site plan approval required for the following. All zoning districts, photovoltaic of any size ground mounted shall be permitted with an administrative site plan from the Office of Planning and Sustainability if one of the following is met, the PV array is constructed over any legal parking lot or driveway, or the PV array is constructed at any assigned landfill site not separated from the site assigned property by any road, or the PV array is constructed in an airport not separated from the runways by the road, and <clears throat> the power and telecommunications extensions are not visible from the public way. That's all been struck. Um, since this is so extensive, I think I would, would you prefer that I just, is everyone relatively familiar with this and then I would add to this the, um, the new language or would everyone ready for me to read the whole thing? <laughs> well, can I clarify something? So the top section, the section in blue is really what's changed. Right. Um, so, um, it was really just to provide context. There's some minor changes in the, um, there's that one strikeout in that flat, that, um, no, but um, primarily it's that blue text that's yeah. changed, so I don't know if it makes sense. That's what I was thinking, that. just reading the blue text okay. of that. Can I ask one question about the non blue text? Is that allowed? Mm -hmm. so one thing I didn't understand was at the very end, the bold, where it says it's kind of floating at the end, for RR, all those other ones. Mm -hmm. Within uses allowed by special permit, delete the entire bullet for ground mounted PV solar arrays. I didn't understand what that was referring to. Back to okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, great. Okay. I thought yeah. we were yeah. right into the blue. Sorry. Yeah. 
Okay, so, yes, sir. If I might, I, I know many of the people here, and I think quite a significant portion were not at either the previous planning board hearings and are just getting up to speed. So you would prefer that I read the rest? Uh, I, I don't sure. know whether that means read the entire rest or just enough to provide enough context. I don't know. Well, as far as context, it's a little tricky because okay. I, mean, I, I, you know, what I just read, I challenge anyone and defy anyone to explain what I just said. I think the clarity is going to come actually in the discussion. Good. Just see. So why don't, why don't I just do the parts and do it? Um, this includes, this is, these are the additions of projects resulting in more than three acres of canopy removal system shall submit the following information to their application and the board must find that the removal of trees will not negatively impact the health, safety, and welfare of the residents of Northampton by maintaining a robust, diverse uh, ecosystem for residents while also creating renewable energy systems. In order for the board to make such a finding, and we, uh, it's now capital T, uh, the applicant shall submit an analysis of the proposal uh, project's impact relative to the benefit of the solar installation as follows. One, analysis showing that tree removal which occurs on more than one acre of slopes greater than 20% will not cause erosion of topsoil and will not increase uh, siltation of any streams uh, presented, uh, present on the site or within 200 feet of the property boundary. Two, analysis of the forest type and relevant habitat that will be lost. This analysis must include the structure and diversity of the canopy, mid-story and understory of the forested area to be cleared. Analysis must be performed by an individual with a master's degree in wildlife biology or ecological science from an accredited college or university or other competent professional with at least two years of experience in wildlife habitation evaluation. Subsection A, any forested area within which certifiable uh, uh, vernal pools are found must be identified and a permit from the Conservation Commission must be granted prior to review by the Planning Board. B, any forested area containing clusters of five or more trees 100 years old or older shall be preserved in order to continue to provide high value ecological benefit to the community. Connection of old growth, uh, old growth trees to surrounding sands of trees shall be maintained. And C, as part of the forest type analysis, the report shall contain information regarding the abundance and distribution of habitats within the region and of the specific site and any historical information on the extent and quality of these habitats and impact of clearing on these habitats. The applicant must show through analysis that the habitat is not fragmented and that connectivity remains in the proposed conditions. And then all the other additions are just a renumbering of the original uh, proposal. How's that? Okay, so Carolyn, do you want uh, you want to um, expand on this a little bit? Or? Sure. Okay. So at the last hearing, um, there was a lot of um, there were a lot of questions and comments um, about the ordinance and whether there was enough. Um, there was concern about that there wasn't enough. Um, um, I guess on two sides that there wasn't specific enough about the evaluation of what we're trying to protect. Um, and let me just take a step back. The whole premise behind the modifications that are in front of you are about um, lifting um, a hard and fast cap on the amount of trees that can be removed for the purpose of creating an industrial scale or large scale solar um, array system. And um, uh, so this ordinance in front of you would um, modify our existing rules, um, essentially eliminate that cap, but then provide specific rules on how you get a permit um, when you're removing so um, a certain amount of um, forested area. And the comments that received in the first round of this um, related to, um, initially the, um, the uh, proposal was to put threshold, the threshold of review 
at five acres, so there's a concern that that was too much area before new requirements would kick in. Um, and also that um, certainly from the city solicitor's standpoint that we need to be more specific about how, what this analysis would do and how that relates to trying to protect the city of Northampton residents' um, uh, safety, health, and welfare um, in, that would be consistent with what the rules are at the state for um, <coughs> permitting these sort of exempt class of, of uses. Um, so internally from our department, our, we went and um, took those comments and then came up with some additional standards. We uh, modified the threshold for review from five acres to three acres, um, and then added an analysis, a required analysis of the core habitat and sort of tried to pull out important things that would be important to understanding what the impact to an area would be if you take out three acres or more of forested land. Still allowing a permit to be approved by the planning board through site plan approval, um, but giving more information, making sure that more data is collected as part of the process that the board could evaluate that. The other piece um, which, um, going back through sort of the 10th time or more, <laughs> Um, with the city solicitor, um, there was concern on his part, and I'll let Alan talk about that if, that's, if you all want, um, and why there's an additional elimination of this um, site plan approval criteria for um, solar arrays over landfills and at airports, is that um, there was a concern that that was, that was um, taking a particular use and um, pulling it out of the, um, and, and treating it differently from all other uses in his zoning district, and you can't really do that. So the other piece of it is that we already have um, a solar array at the landfill. We're not gonna have another site assigned landfill probably in Northampton. So it's, that point's probably moot. The airport has its own system as well. We only have one airport. I can't see us getting a second airport since we lost one a couple decades ago anyway. Um, so that's that piece, and I know it adds a little bit of, may add a little bit of confusion, but that was the reason why that's been deleted. The, the concern was spot zone. The concern was uniformity. Right. Okay. Um, you know, uh, an airport use, uh, when um, a, u a property in a district is put to a certain use, you can't just say, well, if you put to that use, then you have different rules than everybody else in the district. Um, this was, there's a requirement of uniformity under the, uh, the Zoning Act, and I was concerned about uniformity. I was also concerned about, there was this whole thing about not being separated by a road or by a runway, and I, it, it just didn't make logical sense, so but that's why I questioned it. And that was, that's been in the, in the ordinance since we first adopted all of these changes in 2011. Um, and then, uh, so that section that you, um, essentially that core section that you just went over there with the big blue um, <coughs> section is uh, where the bulk of the substantive changes were made since the February 11th public hearing. And the planning board voted on March 28th to recommend this version to move forward as opposed to the original one that was um, uh, introduced to city council and then amended a bit on the way. Alan, your opinion relative to the changes are not significant enough to re-trigger? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, council Klein. Can you um, give us a little bit of a recap of how the planning board um, did their analysis, what the discussion, the content of the discussion was? Um, <clears throat> sure. Um, so we talked initially about um, why the, th um, the threshold from five acres went down to three. Um, they wanted to get, you know, a sense of, of that and, and um, I presented that in the ordinance based on the two examples of large-scale um, solar arrays that we have permitted in the city that have been, one of them was un just under the 24, uh, 25,000 board foot cap. 
and got a special permit from the planning board. Um, and that was just about a two acre um, tree clearing for that, right about at 25,000 board feet. And then the other, um, which is where we discovered there was a workaround was the CED project about three acres um, equated to 25,000 board feet on that um, project, which is the Willard Pit solar um, installation. It's um, not yet underway, but it's close to pulling permits. So we talked about where the three acres came from and why um, staff is recommending that as a, as a threshold number. Um, and so there's a little bit of discussion about that. There's a discussion about um, you know, some board members had a concern about how board members would be able to evaluate um, a study or a presentation from a, a consultant, um, given that the area of expertise on the planning board isn't necessarily in habitat evaluation, but the board deals with lots of different studies um, from stormwater to traffic to, um, in some cases, wetlands evaluation. So in the end, the board felt comfortable um, with sort of adding another component to um, review, uh, depending on the project. Um, and I think for the most part, um, the planning board felt um, really comfortable with that, that it made more um, um, sense to have something that um, dove a little deeper into um, what kind of impacts there would be with tree clearing. So it was not a lengthy discussion. I felt pretty comfortable with it. So I think I heard an implication that the three acre threshold came about because we already have approved two um, large solar arrays. And one of them is two and one three cleared two and three right. respective right. acres. Um, so it somehow is in keeping with what we've done so far. Yep. But I guess I question if that's necessarily a way in which, I mean, I understand there's a look back that you need to do, but that doesn't mean that moving forward we couldn't require fewer acres. So um, I, I'm just. It seems that, like a strange way to kind of come up with the number three in terms of acreage. So um, it's true. You can pick any number you want for this kind of evaluation to kick into place. Um, I think because we were coming at a hard cap at 25,000 board feet, I wanted, I started, I used that as a starting point um, because below that people could come in and didn't, it wouldn't, um, um, you know, they could get a special permit without, you know, a blink of an eye, not really, but, um, you know, without much, um, certainly not this in-depth evaluation. So that was the place where I started. And, and it's hard to, you can't, oh, not every, as we talked about the last time, not every forest is the same, so then it's not going to be the same geographic area. Um, at, from one place to another that will directly correlate to the um, commercial timber that's taken out of that area. Yet we still have kind of regardless of what type of forest it is and how old it is and all of that kind of stuff, we're still talking about three acres as, as, a, as a number that applies to any project. Right. So without looking at the, the quality of the forest and the sequestration involved and all of that kind of stuff. Right. But, I mean, at the same time, we have to create a uniform standard. So um, it, you wouldn't want it to be dependent upon the type of forest it is. However, I mean, if you set a threshold, no matter what it is, if it's one acre, two acres, or three acres, or more, um, through this evaluation, um, the board could make a determination whether that's the most appropriate place to do tree clearing. Maybe the applicant has to shift things around. Um, and that way you'd get at some forested areas have higher value for certain habitats versus another forested area. 
And then my last question for now is, um, is the sequestration question? Because that was something that was talked about quite a bit. And I don't see anything here that um, requires some kind of analysis or measurement of what the carbon sequestration benefits are of a particular forest versus a solar array, and I'm wondering if that somehow got lost or what the thinking was behind not asking for that level of analysis. So, um, I'm so you're thinking that item three doesn't get at that, um, that didn't change from one of the earlier versions. So, the criteria under three. I just I, I recall distinctly from the last. Um, hearing that that was one of the issues that a number of, um, of people brought up. You know, how do you make that determination? How do we measure the amount of carbon? Or what, what the kind of comparison is in terms of ecological usefulness of a solar array versus the trees that are, you know. So I think what we feel we're trying to get at is that three, and then in combination with ensuring that the stumps remain in the ground um, so that there's not a release at that level as well. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, I'm guessing you'll be popping up again as, as, mm -hmm. as questions come up. Um, any, so, uh, actually, I, I'm going to turn to the solicitor first and see if you have any thoughts or opinions beyond. I understand that by removing mm -hmm. minutes that there are certain rigidities or certain criteria that there are that um, that concerned you as far as it qualifies for, for law? Right. We, had, we had no real way to analyze um, the habitat that's being lost, so that was a concern over the, the, the tree stands that were being lost and balancing them against um, the benefits of solar energy. And as I said last time, these are all noble things to protect and, and they're, they're, at, they're in conflict in, to some degree. And, um, uh, but I'm I'm much more comfortable with this draft. Uh, this is, you know, there's no, there's never going to be a perfect formula here to, to get to the bottom of this. There's going to have to be some, um, some discretion applied here by the board uh, when analyzing a proposal. And, you know, when we talk about three acres, uh, you know, much of zoning feels arbitrary. I mean, why uh, one acre as opposed to a half an acre or for, for a lot size? Why 100 feet of frontage and not 200 feet of frontage? I mean, you can, you can ask those questions about almost any part of zoning, um, but lines have to be drawn, and that's what we're trying to do, and protect forests while um, you know, recognizing and respecting the, the uh, sort of exalted place that solar, solar has in zoning. <laughs> It's also in the context of the state not catching up by any stretch. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in, they're still back on roof mounted arrays right. and they, they have not discussed large industrial systems. That's right. Right. And so we have to make up our own guidelines, which are also always in jeopardy of review by the state or at least by right. sewers. Right. Yeah. Um, opponents or neutral or people willing to say, wanting or willing to speak on uh, on this topic yeah, or with any questions? I think um, you answer my question. Yeah, Amy, last Amy, line. You no, I just want to know if you're going to answer my question that I didn't understand the last line, and you said you would come back to it. Right. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So, so Carolyn, <clears throat> the the bold type that um, Amy's referring to, the very last line for R R W S P S R U R A U R B within the uses allowed by special permit, delete the entire bullet for ground mounted. EV solar array. So um, this is this goes back to the discussion about um, taking it out of the special permit realm, which really gives discretion to the board to say no. They don't really need any reason to say no, essentially, under special permit. And so because we're creating this whole site plan, um, the range of criteria under site plan, we're sh essentially shifting it from a special permit 
uh, review to a site plan in order to address the concern or the lack of understanding at the state level as to how much control um, or ability the city has to say no to these things. So it's just clearly saying, you're gonna get a permit if you meet these very, very specific criteria. Can you satisfy your question? I, I understand what Carmen said. I'm not trying to understand how these words work, but that's okay. I understand well, what she said. So. <laughs> okay. um, any other? I'm sure there's people queued up to ask or say something. A lot of folks here. So, and and well, like Lily, actually, do you want to speak first? Sure. Actually, relative to uh, sure the committee's concerns. Okay, sure. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I'm wearing a couple of hats, but I think I'll start with with the with the chair of the trade commission hat. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for doing this. I I uh, also realize that we as a municipality are faced with um, questions that we really shouldn't have to answer. These are state state level questions about um, the appropriateness of siting um, solar arrays, and and so here we are um, trying to hash these out ourselves. Um, uh, we've been very engaged in the process the whole time. Uh, at, you know, we asked for a continuation the first time, and um, you uh, graciously uh, honored it because we wanted time to consider this. And then, and so after that, we knew we had a little time. Um, I under, we understood. I kept asking um, Rich, our tree warden, about um, how a new draft is going after the, the continuation, and you know, we heard that it was going to be sent to Alan first. Uh, because that was the log jam before was was this issue of was the draft even legal um, and so when that finally passed out of his hands back to Carolyn that was just hours before the first, the last planning board meeting um, obviously we didn't have enough time to review it um, so I went to the planning board meeting and I asked for continuation and, and they did not feel that that was necessary so I'm hoping that now that um, we, the Tree Commission, has had a chance to look substantively at the new draft, that you will um, take our our um, our comments as a um, as really our first opportunity to give them, than not coming in late in the game. Um, so yes, we had a very robust discussion. We came up with a whole list of questions and concerns. Um, Carolyn Grant us the opportunity this morning um, for Todd and I, Todd, is, Todd Ford is the vice chair of the commission, to, um, to discuss them and that was very helpful. Um, and uh, had a lot of our questions met. Uh, she considered some, some changes which I would love to present as options. And um, and you know, in some, she said, "Well, you know, give it a pitch to the commission, uh, to the subcommittee, and see how they go." So we didn't agree 100% all things, but I think we got pretty, um, you know, we moved forward. And I'm hoping that I, I appreciate the urgency in um, in you know closing a loophole. Certainly, we don't want more people cutting down forests before they even have to apply for a permit. So. Totally appreciate that. Appreciate the movement that this draft has gone in, in looking more broadly at um, the value of forests beyond carbon sequestration um, to habitat. I think that is wonderful. Um, I'm going to pass these out for your consideration. So, so these are. This is post my meeting this morning with Carolyn, and I want to apologize. It is not on the latest draft. It's not on the uh, so on, on the, the original. So it's not on the original. It's on like version. Two. It's close enough. It's it's going to give you an idea um, of where we want to go, and we tried to be as specific as possible um, about the area where we thought changes need to be made. So, in the um, where you don't see our specific slash out changes, you can assume that we support the language in in um, the planning department's latest draft. So. Um, I, if you wouldn't mind, can I can I indulge you in going through these um, sure, one no, that's, by one? That, that's fine. Okay, um, I'm going to actually skip over the first one, which is on page two, which says projects resulting in more than, and we cross out three and put one acre of canopy. I feel like that's a big one that I want to circle back to, <laughs> um, but I will circle back to it. So I'm going to go to the next one, which is two um, B. Does everyone see that? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So any forested area containing clusters of, and we would say five or more trees, we're fine with that change. But instead of 100-year-old um, trees, which is very hard to evaluate, you have to bore pretty much every tree in the stand to figure out whether or not they're 100 year old, years old or more, um, we would use um, diameter at breast height as a better um, indicator of um, the value of a tree. Um, so, um, so DBH of 20 inches or greater shall be preserved, et cetera, et cetera. And then instead of saying um, connection of old growth trees to surrounding stands, again, hard to determine, we would just say large, referring back to the DPH of 20. So that's the first one. Um, the second is um, three, which is analysis provided by a qualified third party um, showing that the project will be carbon neutral over the first 10 years of operation. Our concern there was that there's, you know, there's just a lot of pseudoscience um, around um, determining carbon neutrality. Uh, you Google it on the website, on the web, and you will come up with um, um, non-peer-reviewed sites. You'll come up with um, industry um, calculations. So we feel very um, strongly that this should be a third-party review. Um, moving on to the third page, which is um, 3A. Uh, this was a point brought up by one of the conservation biologists on our commission who said if you want to, if you want to calculate the carbon loss of a forest you don't you don't calculate just the trees that are standing right now because they would presumably grow over the next 10 years when that solar array is is um, operating and all of that additional carbon that they're capturing needs to be measured so the language we we propose instead of the total volume of trees to be removed would be the total projected volume of live wood after a 10 year period of additional growth. So you're more um, comparing apples to apples in terms of the time span of the value because you're valuing the solar array over its 10 year time span. You're not evaluating at the moment it hits the ground and only then. So apples to apples. Um, and points B and C, uh, subtracting the estimated live wood instead of timber, conversion to the net live wood instead of timber. Um, you know, that gets to the point that all live wood captures carbon, and it's not just timber, which is a, um, a really, it's, a, um, it's an artifact from the forestry industry, um, referring to wood that has, um, you know, economic value. And why would you um, only consider that and not consider all the other wood, the large branches, the twigs, the understory, that have value in capturing carbon? So we feel that live wood is a more appropriate term than timber. Um, and then E, okay. So we had a conversation with Carolyn about um, this idea of assigning wrecks to the city to match or exceed the release of carbon. Um, we felt that, uh, um, uh, a, a more um, immediately beneficial and measurable um, trade, if you are going to trade, would be by contributing to the city's tree fund rather than trading in recs, which is somewhat problematic. <laughs> Alan, I see you nodding your head. Um, and, and the language I have is contribute to the tr city's tree fund in an amount so that 10 years after planting the trees with provided funds, the live wood will equal or exceed the carbon deficit generated by the project. And then um, five is um, somewhat related to the, my, my, our first recommendation, which is to lower this to one acre. So why don't I go back to that first and talk to you about why we feel um, that one acre is a, a better, is a better starting point than three. First of all, we all agree that these are arbitrary starting points and that it's not like at one acre and above we're prohibiting. Now it's just that we're gathering more data. So, um, so two things about that. First of all, the whole three acres, the justification for three acres was related back to this whole notion of 25,000 uh, board feet and the idea that we, we got that number because um, you know, that is, uh, triggers uh, a forestry cutting plan for, for cutting forests, you know, um, when, when you have a forested piece of land that you want to cut for, for other purposes. But um, 
But again, that relates to um, that it's a measurement that is not really applicable to this setting. We're talking about trying to to preserve habitat and and sequester carbon um, for the benefit of our city. Why would we attach it to this very arbitrary and antiquated number? Furthermore, when I reread the guidelines by the Department of Energy Resources um, regarding um, ground-mounted solar arrays, they talk about three levels, small-scale, small medium-scale, and large-scale solar arrays. Um, they define medium-scale as anything that is approximately up to one acre. And the presumption there is that anything over one acre is considered a large-scale ground-mounted system. Um, so if we're going to be if we're going to be attaching ourselves to arbitrary numbers, why don't we attach it to that and protect our resources even further? I mean, really, we're all acknowledging that this um, you know site plan review is about gathering information and making sure that we're protecting the public um, welfare, health, and safety um, when resources are being exchanged, when forest is being exchanged for solar production. So um, we recommend one acre. We feel like one acre is still a substantial number. The, you know, the state um, considers it substantial. And just to remind you, what DAR um, does um, uh, affirm in its guideline is it says DOER strongly discourages locations that result in significant loss of land and natural resources, including farm and forest land, and encourages rooftop siting as well as locations in industrial and commercial districts or on vacant, disturbed land. Significant tree cutting is problematic because of the important water management, cooling, and climate benefits the trees provide. So again, you know, what is significant? It's up for our community to de decide. We do not need to be arbitrarily attached to 25,000 board feet or some kind of acreage equivalent. And even by that measure, you can pack a lot more than 25,000 board feet in, in an acre of mature forest. So, um, the, the last point that I wanted to make is number five, which is um, the removal of stumps or the keeping of stumps. Um, again, why not? Here, Carolyn recommends that it be um, three acres, of, uh, w within the area beyond the first three acres of canopy removed, that stumps be um, required to be left in place. Our language that we recommend, um, and actually I want to be completely transparent about this, I did not have this specific conversation with the Tree Commission about this particular language. Um, this is a conversation that came out of um, our conversation this morning with Todd Ford, Carolyn, and myself. So I want to be, I want to be transparent about that. And, um, and that is that um, the first acre of canopy removed or beyond the area required to access the site for installation, whichever is smaller, stumps for removed trees must remain in place. Again, the idea that stumps do a great job in um, sequestering carbon. Why not minimize their removal as much as possible? Um, certainly, you, we wouldn't want to inhibit the job from going forward, so remove those stumps that are required to allow the installation to, go, to happen, but leave everything else. Any questions? Um, no, well, actually, Alan, you, see, you, you were jotting down a few things, so I, I, I'm not. Uh, I don't believe that the city could require somebody to dip into their pocket and start paying money to the that's, city. That that's called an exaction. It's yeah. illegal. It's not going to happen in Northampton. Let me just say it. It's not going to happen under my watch in Northampton. It's, okay. It's, Didn't it's know a, that. Yes. You learn something new every day. Right. <laughs> uh, you can't require uh, uh, a, an applicant to pay in order to get a, a, uh, a special permit or any kind of permit. Okay. You know, they can pay. provide offsets. But right. they can't. You can't require right. remuneration. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I also, if I if I might, just want to address the one acre issue. Mm -hmm. um, we are in a, an environment where solar is, for better or for worse, is the 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 favorite child of the legislature in this in in, in our conversation here, and. Um, and if I want to clear, and, and I, what I heard Carolyn saying before is, in one case two acres, in another case three acres, got up around the 25,000 board feet. That would require a cutting plan. If I wanted to put up 
a single family house in Northampton, I could cut down an acre with no, with no permission from anybody. I could just cut down an acre of trees and build my house. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing, what you're proposing is to make it more difficult to cut down an acre of trees or an acre and a half of trees for solar, the favorite child of, of, the, of zoning, in favor of something that's less favored in zoning. So if I want to cut down an acre and a half, it's under 25,000 board feet to build whatever I want to build, I can do that with no permission from anybody. But if I want to put up solar, I've got to get a permit from the planning board to cut down that same acre and a half. And that's exactly opposite of what Section 3 envisions. Does that make sense? It does make sense, but again, it gets back to this, uh, to how, how, we, how we convert 25,000 board, board feet to acreage. That's right, and, and what we did was use our experience in what... Two cases. Of two one cases. Of which, one of which, actually two acres was closer to 25,000 board feet. So, but so, nobody's getting us to one acre. The, in no experience that, I mean, if you have science to get us to one acre, fine, but three acres okay. is... Okay. is, is that a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Is that a challenge? I, I think that I, I'm, I'm in favor of the science, and you know, your one acre is is more arbitrary to me than the three acres. Okay, I think it doesn't matter. Hang, hang on a second. We we have to have one conversation at a time. Never do. We'll do this. So, um, okay. All right. We have. That's one point of contention on the on the okay. acre side, and. Um, did you want to speak more to that, Lily? Adele has her hand up. I think other people may have okay. comments to make. Adele? Well, and you know, I'm sorry, I, I, again, I passed, I, I forgot. We know who Lily is, and we actually know who Adele is, but please identify yourself. My name is Adele Franks, and I'm in yeah. with Lawrence. And um, I just wanted to speak to the one acre versus the three acre issue. And that goes back to the uh, DOER document that we're referring to, the Model Zone, the Regulation of Solar Energy Systems that they uh, released in 2014. And um, that document states, um, this is a quote, since medium scale ground mounted systems can reach up to approximately an acre in size, DOER believes it's reasonable and appropriate to provide more regulatory scrutiny via site plan review for these projects in residential districts to protect public health, safety, and welfare. So what? So they're making a distinction right there of that um, uh, larger than an acre is considered large, a large array. And so to me, that's just as much of a justification for us to go by um, a one acre rather than a three acre as this arbitrary 25,000 board feet. So I think the threshold should be one acre rather than three to require the um, special process. Well, I have a question that I think is going back to kind of Lily and Carolyn. Um, I'm just curious, um, I understand you met this morning and Carolyn, you answered a bunch of questions. Um, you worked with Todd to come up with some recommended amendments. And I'm wondering if those were then shared with you, Carolyn, if you have, um, if you feel like you're on the same page, you feel comfortable with the amendments that have been made. I understand Alan's concern about the one versus three. I'm wondering how you feel about that as a planner and conservationist. Um, sure. I mean, I, that, was more, that was probably the biggest area of disagreement. Um, the other language tweaking about changing it from you know, 100 years to 20, 20 inch DBH, fine. I think you know that's a that's a good idea. Um, I think really the difference between the one acre and three acre was, uh, you know, I expressed that I felt comfortable with three acres because it was based on that again that that threshold where no, you know, anybody who wants to clear more than 25,000 board feet needs to get a forest cutting plan, and they can only do that for the purposes of. Um, um, agriculture or forestry um, so it does create it is sort of that line um, and that I felt comfortable with the three acres um, the other one about the tree the offset of the carbon um, you know I was okay um, with that but I can we do allow when significant trees are taken down if you can't plant on your site to replace those you can um, offer payment um, to the city.
city or plant elsewhere in the city. So I felt like it was comparable to that. But again, I suggested that Lily go ahead and just, you know, pitch that to the committee because I didn't. I was sort of neutral on that. Um, it's something for you all to decide. I guess in, in just in follow up to that, um, I would ask you, Lily, um, and I know that you can't speak for the entire Public Shade Tree Committee right now, but um, were we to accept all of the amendments as you put them forward, do you, and I don't even know if procedurally we can kind of backtrack and wait and see if your committee would in fact um, sign on again as a co-sponsor. Um, and is is any kind of endorsement by the Public Shade Tree Committee at this point contingent upon our accepting exactly what you have yeah. recommended here as amendments? We did not have that conversation. I can't answer that procedurally. I'd want to obviously follow the law when it came to how we offer our endorsement. So, we, so all I can say is we did not vote to endorse it at the last meeting. Frankly, we got so deeply in the weeds that, you know, it gobbled up almost our entire agenda. So, unfortunately, I can't really answer that question fairly. Like, I don't know. I mean, I certainly, I, I would be delighted to bring it back and, and see if a motion would be made. So, if we made a decision to continue again um, this hearing and give the Public Shade Tree Committee time to reconsider this, <laughs> however it comes out today um, you would yeah, go ahead and absolutely. do that mm -hmm. so anyone else would like to speak at this point uh, uh, sure yeah well, it's very timely since uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry can you please identify sure uh, Dave Reutman I live in Florence and um, well, what I'm going to do is, is timely given the last comment that you'll see. I'm going to um, reference some comments that we have from uh, Professor Bill Mumaw, who is the um, founder of the Center for International Environment and Resource Policy at Tufts. And if you look uh, Bill Mumaw uh, up, you'll see that he's uh, a lead author on several of the uh, UN uh, intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change. Um, um, report. So he's a noted authority. We're fortunate not only to have him in Massachusetts, but he's an advisor to our um, new Climate Action Now work group, which is focused on farms, forests, and food systems. So uh, Bill did uh, read the ordinance and uh, provided some comments. Um, unfortunately, um, and this is with regard to the last comment in terms of potentially uh, delaying the decision, um, our question to him about the, the specific three acres, we didn't get a, a direct answer from him on that. But there's a very good chance that we can, and that would certainly provide a really good scientific perspective on this. So if it's possible to hold off the, the decision until we get that, uh, I think that would be great. So um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to uh, read the comments. There, there's not a lot of them. Um, Maybe before doing that, I'll just say that um, our group supports what uh, uh, Lily's uh, recommending in terms of, of the changes, uh, 100%. Okay, so um, first of all, Bill says, um, we need more solar, but not at the expense of trees. Uh, solar siding is critical. It needs to be understood that trees are critical carbon storage units, but they're much more than that. They reduce local temperatures in summer by shading streets, by absorbing more sunlight and radiating heat. More importantly, evaporation, evaporation of water from leaves can keep surrounding areas several degrees cooler, reducing the demand for air conditioning and the emissions associated with the electric generation to operate them. If the Northampton City Council wants equivalencies, and that's kind of what we're talking about here, and, and the direction for analysis that could come up with equivalencies. Bill says the city council should including this factor when just mentioned when accounting for trees removed for solar arrays. And by the way, this is a lot of verbiage, so I'll of course make it available to you to <coughs> copy stuff tonight. His second point, uh, city and suburban trees are important for creating a better adapted 
city to a changing climate. So this whole issue of the adaptation. Trees suck up water during a downpour and evaporate it from their leaves. The larger the tree, the more effective it is preventing runoff from more intense precipitation events. Third, so, so Bill didn't have the context I'm interjecting, so his exact language is, I'm surprised that there is no preferred citing language. Um, he didn't understand that we didn't give him the history and context. But he says, for example, installation on landfills, abandoned building sites, or other places previously disturbed, roads, road wider, rights of way, over parking lots, on stores, other large rooftops. And now he says something interesting. Whatever language is deemed legally appropriate, Northampton should achieve this preferred siting. So he's pointing to a, a strategy uh, here. And um, I'm also going to interject something um, that uh, Mr. Seawall commented here. It's just my observation. When you talk about solar as the favorite child of the legislature, um, and that's certainly a fair comment, and many of the people in this room are um, activists for the past five or ten years to try to get more solar in Massachusetts, um, doing lots of, uh, you know, going to the state house and calls and everything. But in terms of the time context, as the favorite child of the legislature, um, if you talk to Joe Comerford or Lindsay Sabadosa now, they're very aware of this issue that we're dealing with right here. And I really don't think that they would uh, put it as one-sided as, as that summary comment. The, the, I think that uh, the legislature, legislature is becoming increasingly aware that uh, we can't uh, just have one or the other. It's a false choice, solar versus trees. I'm going to continue with um, Bill's comments. There are just two more. Um, Bill didn't understand the, the way uh, wetlands or, ver uh, or, or vernal pools dealt with, so he just says there should be a simple ban on disturbing wetland or vernal pools. Finally, uh, and this is something he's doing a lot of research on recently, protection of older trees is important. That provision could be strengthened. Replacing removed larger trees with small ones will not make much of a carbon difference for a very long time. So that, those are um, words. He can back that and everything else he says in here up with uh, numbers and research. So that's um, really um, why um, I'm personally thinking that it would be really, really great. And not just, you know, delay it inevitably, but with a time frame and, you know, hold uh, us accountable for getting uh, that information back to you. Um, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Ed Olmstead. I live in Florence. Um, I'm, I came to the meeting because I heard what was going on, and my concern is that there'd be a plan um, that considers sequestration of carbon versus solar arrays. I would like to see more solar. I prefer to see them in parking lots or on rooftops, but I'm glad that the this is being considered seriously here. Um, I'm not fully up to, up to speed on all of the uh, what's being proposed, but I had a question on um, uh, when you're talking about you can build a house, cut down an acre of trees to put up a house, okay, but I sort of see solar farms as industrial areas more than like a house. Um, if a solar you know, and I'm concerned about what happens to them. So you can sell your house, it's gonna sell for many, many years. What's gonna happen with solar arrays that now we found we can trick our computers from these room-sized things down to a laptop? What happens to these solar arrays once the, the technology changes and they're no longer needed? I see in section um, four, it says, uh, 50% uh, of the property at least shall be protected from tree clearing and future development for the duration of the operation of the, the solar array installation until such time as the system is decommissioned and removed. Is there any way in which we uh, were going to be ensuring that the system will be taken down it will be, and the land will be returned to uh, a biological habitat? I'm not sure 
you know, it says it'll be if it's decommissioned and removed, then that's that would be what would happen. But it would seem to be it would be in our interest not to have these things, parts of the forests or parts of the natural area, broken up with these leftover parking lots or whatever they might be. Um, so I'd be interested to know that in this idea of m balancing the need to generate solar and the need to keep sequestration and, and natural habitat, that there'd be some way to push the idea of this, this being able to be returned to a natural habitat. And I, my question is, is there anything there? The other question I have is, as far as siting goes, if you have a, a parcel way away from town, way away from any other transmission lines, is there some ordinance that restricts how that happens? Uh, can you put, mm -hmm. if I put something down here, I assume there's going to be minimum distribution uh, this, uh, uh, problems to the, the natural habitat, but if I put it away somewhere else, then some other something's going to have to be built in order to, mm -hmm. to go there. Is there any uh, way in which that's being considered in, these, uh, in this ordinance or some other ordinance? Um, Callan, would you speak to Mr. Olmstead's uh, question about decommissioning reclamation and then also uh, transmission lines and, and distance? Um, and the, so the planning board does require a bond as part of the uh, as part of the permit process so you get your permit and there may be some conditions one of those conditions would be to post a bond for the cost of decommissioning the system after it's um, uh, at the end of its lifespan um, transmission lines that's a I mean that's a big concern is the visibility of any lines that need to be installed so um, I think there was language in there that you can't, that it can't, and maybe that was, um, I have to go back and check the general ordinances. Um, generally, then the last two um, decisions, the board has said, you can put uh, poles on your property, but not if it's not new poles on an existing right of way. So it does have, uh, I mean, there is the ability, I think, to restrict how that's done. Uh, when you're talking about these, uh, it's true, when you're talking about these um, rural areas, which is primarily where these, um, I would think, this ordinance would be taking effect in large forested areas, that's going to be a problem with finding um, a way to access those transmission lines. We, I remember uh, it was a year ago, of course, that we were having this discussion about mm -hmm. uh, proximate I mean, poles in particular, above ground poles, approximately, particularly as it related to agricultural right. lands. Yes, sir. Yep, yeah, sure, come on up. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Nick Warren, Northampton. Thanks for doing this. I have a couple of questions, um, a lot of which have already been brought up, but the, I'm particularly concerned with the actionability of the criteria that are put forward for the uh, so-called expert who is doing the, doing the analyses of the land before the permit is granted. I'm not sure how one works it out, but they seem to be, as I believe you mentioned, as some other people mentioned, they're fairly general. And I'm not sure that the ordinance as written deals with the actual impact of the solar installation. For instance, um, the, the expert is supposed to go and um, give a basic accounting of the habitats that are affected by this. And what are we talking about? How many animals? How many how many habitats? We've got hundreds of habitats in a piece piece of forest. Which of the animals, uh, birds, and plants that we're particularly concerned about? Are we concerned about big ones like you know, lynxes or squirrels? Are we concerned with arthropods? Um, I'm not quite sure how how the um, when the permit is being considered you're going to be able to say well this actually is too much habitat habitat destruction or too much Habitat, habitat degradation. So I think that needs to be cleaned up and made a lot more specific. Um, it also talks about the structure and the diversity of the canopy, the understory and the overstory. Again, the same questions are, what kind of destruction or changes in the overstory, uh, understory canopy are we willing to accept and what are we, are we not? So I think that needs to be tightened up also. I think, there, I think that we're looking at the right things. But I don't think we have any criteria upon which a board could make a decision to grant a permit. 
So it's that lack of specificity that I'm concerned about. Secondly, a couple of very small ones. One is the 200%. The 200%. Um, I believe that that's meant to refer only to installations on private property or private houses, something like that. But it's not clear. I'm not sure if it also means um, <clears throat> factories, big factories with flat rooftops, things like that. That's a request for clarification. Um, and I think that if we're trying to push developers towards using parking lots and using roofs and things like that, it's obviously much more expensive for a developer to do that than it is to cut down a forest. Maybe, I'm not sure it's obvious. But I think if we're going to do that, we might want to think about that 200% restriction. Um, because uh, many of these installations, if they're going to be using these sites, would be way, way more than the 200% of the individual uh, usage requirements for that particular site. And I'd like to see that at least considered and maybe loosened depending upon how it's going to be used. And the third one is a very, very small point. I'm not sure that the leaving of stumps in the ground is actually an effective way of sequestering carbon. The stumps rot. And when they rot, they release their carbon. I'm not sure if it's, if it's actually an important thing to be thinking about. That's it. Thank you. Um, yes, right. Oh. Excuse me. I'm Helen Armstrong, North Hampton. I want to address the point that um, Nick Warren just made about leaving stumps in the ground. Because if you think of a tree from the ground up, that's what gets cut off, but there's an equivalent mass of roots underneath. The roots are as big as the canopy, so they go down very far in some species, and leaving them in the ground is an effective way to control erosion and facilitation of the adjacent water base. So, I just want to say thank you for listening to that. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> My name is Kitsang Booth. I live in Northampton. And I think in this time of climate change, it seems kind of foolish to pit trees against solar when, in fact, we really need both. Um, I like to point out that every tree is a tree house. You know, we have a really anthropocentric way of looking at the world, but a tree, the canopy, animals live there, they're beneficial birds and insects, and then underneath the roots hosts a, a really complex web of life with bacteria and fungi. And those are the things that you can't really see, but that are really valuable in holding the soil and um, in sequestering carbon and really making our life healthier for us. So I support any amendments, Lily's amendments, that we need to be close to the to Garish, uh, Prospect Street, Northampton, and I uh, also work with Dave and the other folks here at Climate Action Now and in the group on uh, foods and forestry as a form of carbon sequestration. And I guess just to kind of frame this thing in the reality of what we're facing, you know, we, the science tells us that we have 10 to 12 years to address the climate catastrophe. And as we speak, people are doing research, um, including uh, Bill, Bill Lamar, Bob Leverett, who are actually out there measuring old trees and measuring the amount of carbon that's being sequestered. And they're finding that old trees are sequestering huge amounts of carbon. And this is new research. So I, you know, as I, I, I don't know that it's accurately reflected in here in terms of, of how, how you're measuring carbon sequestration. So that's one issue. The second is that 
we don't have a lot of options left to prevent the work of climate change. And one of the reasons Climate Action Now is devoting a lot of resources to this new group is that carbon sequestration is one of the very few things we can do to actually sink carbon. I mean, people are talking about they're going to invent all this technology to sink carbon, and that's actually good old-fashioned trees are sinking carbon. So I implore you, like, the idea of building solar sites and cutting down forests and trees, it, it's just, it, it, it's wrong. We can't, we can't do it. Um, and if, if there's some, something afoot, we need to minimize it as much as possible. We absolutely need trees. I know I've had many conversations with Carolyn because we're building a house and um, we're actually building two houses on some land and we completely reformulated our plan to get down to under one acre. I know if you build, and you can clarify here, but if you um, disturb more than one acre, you have to replace all the trees, right, um, in, any, in any new um, development. And, you know, we're just going out of our way on a personal level to do anything that we can to be closer to the road, whatever we have to do not to cut down trees. And I, I, I just feel like the reality check is that, hey, this is one of the few things we can do. So let's tighten this up. Let's, let's protect trees and let's build solar on, you know, in parking lots, on rooftops. I mean, there's so many other options. Thank you. Anyone else? Unless somebody Marty, else. Yeah. Do you have your hand up, Martin? Or? I, yeah, I do. I do, I do. Um, this is this is just a quick one. First, I want to support the amendments that. Me, oh, I'm Marty Nathan. Nathan. I'm sorry, 24 Massasoit Street, uh, here in Northampton. I uh, first wanted to support the amendments that Lily and the Tree Com Committee have proposed, but very specifically the one acre deeper analysis. Um, the, the triggering of the deeper analysis with one acre rather than three acres. I just asked Lily what, when the 25,000 board feet uh, triggering a plan for timbering was adopted in 2011. And so much has changed in our understanding of where we are in the world since 2011 and the relationship between climate change and our survival and how quickly it's coming and what is the role of tree of trees and it's constantly evolving and, and I think we know more than we did eight years ago. Um, and I think that we have to do our absolute best to uh, both produce as much renewable energy as possible using solar but also sequester as much as possible so I fully support the one acre um, triggering of the deeper analysis I think that's critical I know it's harder I know you can get a lot of flack but you know my Kansas City Council is always got flack we know that <laughs> that's why we're so wonderful um, so um, I ask you please to go with that one uh. I'm Amy Meltzer, I live on Olive Street in Northampton. I have a few questions that I didn't quite know yet, but that's I'm asking. So <laughs> one question I have is, so I heard Lily talk about changing from the age of the tree to the 20 dBH, which struck, resonated for me as the language we're using in the significant tree ordinance. Is that, so, so does the significant tree ordinance apply to trees that are that in a solar array project does that ordinance apply in this situation i believe so yeah. yes. yes okay so so that means there's a replacement requirement right okay uh my next question is it legal is there any way um to mandate or evaluate kind of the quality of the array because it seems to me whatever size we decide on mm -hmm. There's a huge range in the lifespan of a solar array, uh, and when we cut down trees, they're gone, right? And if we if somebody's building a solar array that is likely to last 15 years versus 40 years, and I'm not familiar, I'm just kind of wondering generally, is that something that can be regulated or evaluated in the process, the actual like 
quality of the project? Is that <coughs> What I'm hearing, Amy, is that you're talking really more about the duration of the project than the quality of the project. Uh, yeah, I guess I don't know what the linkage is. I imagine mm -hmm. that. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I've mm -hmm. uh, uh, somebody here made a comment that I completely agree with, which is um, these 20 generally these solar projects are 20-year projects. Mm -hmm. I don't expect any of them to make 20 years. And I represent, I represent solar installers, and I've never done one that was cutting down trees. I, I, usually this battle is over farms. This battle is almost always over farms. And every solar development I've ever been involved with has been on agricultural land. And that's usually the, the, the place that the battle is drawn. Um, and so, uh, I, but I may, I have no illusion that, that this is the technology that we're going to be using 10 years from now. So I that's really have no, huge. Like, I but, really appreciate but there's no way to, that. there's no way to have a crystal ball right. and know what the technology is going to be in the future. So, um, you know, again, I, I just want to go back to the fact that um, I didn't mean that our current legislators consider this a, a, a priority use. The statutes create a priority Understood. use, and this is one of them, and that's the nature of the problem right, we're right. in here. Understood. My next question actually relates to that. What would be the process? So, so we know that there are lots of other. I totally respect and understand why Alan doesn't want us to be one of the communities that's testing the test cases. But there are a lot of communities that do require a site plan approval. Mm -hmm. So, should that be tested in court and approved at the city? I mean, if there's a point at which the, the site plan approval holds up in court, um, can we go that route? Like, is there, how does there's, it? There's no question that we can require site plan approval. <laughs> the question is, the criteria for determining that that um, a solar installation must be denied because it is because the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of the to require. The process by which we we collect that information is not an issue here. Site plan approval is a completely appropriate way to gather that information or for the board to gather that information. Okay, so so here now, I, I don't have any specific personal recommendations, not I don't have any expertise in this area, but I would say as a person who uh, cares a lot about the public voice, having the opportunity to be heard, that's what I value about site plan approval, is that there's, it, it slows down the process and the space for lots of voices. And so, so I'm disappointed that that's off the table, and so I just wanted to name that. And, you know, it's not off the table. It's not, going okay. to be site plan approval. Okay. It's not going to be special permits. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so she's using the wrong word. Ah. I'm like, I am a special permit. Oh, okay. So take back everything I just said at the last minute. Which is, we know that other towns do require special permits, and I understand why you are hesitant at this time to have to places. But, you know, like, um, should that be held up in court, special permit? Is that a place we can go? We, like, is we, there a process by which we, we would reevaluate or? The laws, of course, are, are essentially living, is a living process. Right. And we can respond and change and adapt. Now, as you can tell, through a public process, it's not quick. We right. don't turn on a dime. Right. But the fact is, is that if, if uh, circumstances indicated it's appropriate and, and the better way to proceed, then yes, absolutely. Okay. I'm sorry, I used the wrong term before. I, I guess um, what, what I notice, he, the only thing I really close to things I want to really come forward on, one is I would just urge you and I'll urge the whole city council that whatever you decide, that we also recognize that uh, all these ways that we're trying to create more energy needs to be balanced with methods that actually uh, urge people to use less energy. And I just want to make sure the city's always thinking about that because we cannot build our way out of this situation and we can't create enough energy to meet the current needs no matter what we do. So I hope that the city will continue to think about ways that we incentivize reduction of our consumption of energy and not just increasing our production of energy by any means. 
But I also want to say that I love that our city has create has a tree warden and has created this commission, and that the process, you know, maybe because of this loophole, um, seems to have not given enough time for our the, the experts that we've chosen for our city to weigh in. So whatever it takes to make sure that the tree warden and the public tree tree commission is really heard and there's time for the back and forth instead of the back and forth with Alan and Lily happening here, that we make space and enough time um, for their full approval. And like I think all the citizens of the city would really appreciate knowing that you came to an agreement that everyone could live with. So, thank you. Uh, yes, and just quickly though, Amy, I want to respond to um, your, your call for conservation and I think I would I would refer you to the Energy and Sustainability Commission, which is actually part, that is part parcel of the commission. Okay. And there are a number of people here who can testify to the dedication and devotion <clears> to <throat> that principle. So it's it's not just, the, 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 the ethos of this community has been in that direction is reduction, conserve, and, and to reduce our carbon impact on the, at least our fair share. Alan, you I, I just want to address the special permits site plan approval distinction. Um, we could require a special permit, but it will be a special permit in name only, because a special permit is a very specific set of discretionary powers granted to a board, which, again, I, I feel like a broken record, but section three, the, the, you know, that, that priority use, requires that we not apply the traditional special permit standards and I just want to assure you that whether it's site plan approval or special permit, a hearing is held for both of them. And so you will have the opportunity to be heard whether it's site plan approval or special permit. Am I right about that, Carolyn? A public hearing is held. So that part of it is you would not be able to distinguish between a site plan approval and a special permit. The, the difference is the extent of discretion that the board has to deny the project. That's the only distinction between special permit and site plan approval. Thank you for clarifying. I actually thought site plan approval was what happened in the little office. When all no, no, no. The planning board together. does the site plan approval. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Hello. My name is Marissa Weiss from uh, Northern Ave in Northampton. Um, and um, thank you for this uh, very interesting conversation. Um, and listening to the voices, it strikes me that um, there's a uh, discrepancy coming out of uh, between the one acre and three acre um, recommendations. And um, in general, I like the idea personally of um, more review being triggered at one acre because it seems like then we have more information. Information is good. Um, but then there's the flip side of potentially setting up this um, incentive that would be kind of um, an unintended incentive to make it a pathway for development, um, other kinds of development incentivized by going with the one acre, making solar harder than, for example, housing. Um, and I'm wondering if it's known um, how many parcels fall in that one to three acre space and if it's known who are the folks who might consider land use decision making and if it's possible to just get a little bit more information about how people might want to use their land um, in that one to three acre space and whether that would actually be a, an unintended incentive away from solar and towards other kinds of development or whether it might not pan out that way, depending on um, who the folks are in that space and, and how many parcels there are. How do you want to address that? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think any of these array, I mean, these large scale arrays are going to occupy much bigger area than one acre. So if you're talking about a four or five megawatt system, which are generally what we're seeing here, and they might be, they're even bigger and sort of when you have more area. So there, but I think the question is how many, how many parcels do we have that are 
largely, for the most part, forested, that people may look to um, this use. And, and I think that's a hard number to come by. I mean, we have private property owners that may not have developable parcels because they don't have frontage or there's not access, but you can still put solar on those parcels and you can't do anything else there. Um, it, but it also, it also relates back to the incentives at the state level and um, who's interested in moving forward, who has the ability to do that. So um, it, it's, it would be hard to sort of quantify that. Just to follow up on that, so it seems that there are plenty of restrictions for residential build-out that don't apply for solar. For example, you mentioned a few, um, frontage, um, slope, uh, things like that. So there are good, I mean, one could argue that, yeah, we're applying a little bit more uh, scrutiny on this side, but we apply a whole lot more scrutiny on that side. So like, does everything have to be a perfect apple to apple exchange? Or can we acknowledge that in some areas, solar uh, um, is under a different kind of lens and residential is under its own? I mean, just going to your concern, Alan. Alan, I wonder if you could... Oh, well, actually, oh, Councilor Murphy has a chance to speak. You know, just, just an observation. The last month when we were here, the planning board had come up with a version of this that the Tree Commission had not had a chance to comment on. And now we're getting a version of this that you guys came up with that they haven't had a chance to comment on. Uh, we're timing on both ends. Yeah, and this body or even the council does not have the expertise to really negotiate this out I mean I would really like to see staff and the tree commission and the planning board figure out something they can all endorse and then bring it to us and say we have we have reached an understanding here we would like to bring this forward to your approval we, we can't arbitrate this because we don't have that expertise the board the boards and committees have that expertise you know, we can sit here and talk about it all day, but until until the planning board and the staff and the tree all agree what to bring forward to us to say we like this, you know, we don't we're not in a position to have the capacity to decide and arbitrate for you what's best. That really is up to you guys. I know Carol that that makes you know Carolyn have to be the referee for this thing, but we're the wrong ones that do that. Well, I would say procedurally, and Alan, you can jump in too, I mean, the, the process for ordinances going forward is to be referred out to planning board and legislative matters before going back to full city council, and anybody can have feedback into that public hearing process and that loop. Um, you know, the planning board felt very comfortable with three acres. No, they didn't have someone coming in and saying one acre, but um, I don't know that necessarily, like, I think, I. I feel like anybody at this in the public hearing process can suggest something okay. and planning board could at once level could say um, thank you for your suggestion we want to go in this other route or yes we'll recommend that but the same thing would happen to this body you know you're you would also have to sort of ferret that out mm -hmm. I, I don't I mean it's your decision to, to um, make in terms of who you want to, um, you know, what weight you want to give to what committee and what recommendations you take. Um, but I'm, I don't know that the planning board would necessarily change its stance in a re-opener. You don't know, but have you gone to debate with them about this? No, because... Not this version, because we just got this today, so they right, haven't seen and it. we had gotten it three hours before the meeting. Right, so we're back down to... They send us something, and you haven't commented, and you sent something, and they haven't commented. Which is why I requested a continuation of yeah. the hearing. Which I think is a good idea, because then it gives you a chance to get together with them. You know, because if, if both sides throw your hands up and say, we don't know, you settle it, okay, you're going to take a crapshoot with us. But we'd much rather you have dialogue about it than we throw the dice and say, okay, it comes up this way. It just seems more reasonable to do it with you all either agreeing or coming in and say, we can agree. So you guys put the dartboard on the wall and throw the dart and see what comes up because that's what it's going to be with us because we don't have the expertise you guys have we just gotta you know what we do is political decisions and they don't always work out for everybody in a logical way all you have to do is read any newspaper to realize that that doesn't always work we'd much rather have your expertise than our just deciding let's go with this one <coughs> Council Klein. 
Well, I was going to say something else, but I have the rare pleasure here of agreeing with Tom. <laughs> 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 Just to say, and I think, you know, I always tell people, I feel like as a counselor, I'm a generalist. And I try and learn as much as I can about anything that comes before us. And I've tried to do that with this, and I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of different people coming from a lot of different backgrounds. We're hearing an incredible amount of expertise in this room. Um, and you know, I, I was trying to think, is there a way in which we have ferreted out enough here to make a decision and make a recommendation for the full council? And it feels really clear to me that the real experts in the city around this are the, the um, Public Shade Tree Committee. And I think the Energy and Sustainability Commission, too, probably needs to play a more active role um, together with the Public Shade Tree Committee. So I feel pretty strongly that we need to, um, to continue this and to send this back. Um, I don't know where that leaves the planning board's positive vote. I'm not clear on the procedural part of that, but I do think that we need um, we need a sign off and we need an endorsement from both the, the Sustainability Commission and the, the Tree Committee. This is um, actually a discussion that would be best after the close, after we either choose to close the hearing or not, so we mm -hmm. can do that. Um, mm -hmm. If that was a motion to continue, I'll second that because okay. I'm just reluctant to close it because if there's more input to be taken, we can't really do that after we close a public hearing, which is why I think it's a good thing to continue so that we can all come back and you can provide new information. I don't want to decide on what I know now. All right, we now have a motion on the floor. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I didn't make that motion. Um, did you second it? Uh, oh, you did not why said I seconded it if it was a motion? <laughs> It certainly is up to you to say it is. I'm not hearing whether or not heard from everybody that wants to say something. All right. Okay. So in the absence of a, of a motion, then uh, we're going to continue. And actually, okay, so Councilor Nash, you had your hand up. Sharon, and well, you can speak as well. Yep. No, I got it. Yes. It's a great turnout here today. Yeah, but you're going to identify yourself. Oh, uh, Jim Nash, Ward 3 City Councilor. Um, yeah, great turnout, lots of really great input here. Um, and um, as always, coming to a committee meeting, I learned something that's going to help me later on. Um, Attorney Sewell, you mentioned that somebody, if somebody's developing an acre of property, they can clear cut that property. Is there any upper limit on that? If somebody's clear, when you get to twenty-five thousand board feet, you're going to need a, uh, a cutting plan. And okay, so that's sort of why we got, you know, sure. that was a benchmark that exists, and that's I think how the the ordinance got there originally. So that could be anywhere between two, three, four acres, depending on. So I'm not. I'm not. A I don't know. I I'm no just idea. asking it, about. It's totally dependent upon the forest. What kind of trees? The age. The you know the quality. Density. Yeah. So you can't just. It's not across the board. It's, it's all. It varies. Okay. Because I'm wondering if there's a way uh, to have something that it needs to be uniform. What we're doing. You know, if we're setting an upper limit on. You know how much um, forest or trees can be removed if it's consistent for whatever the use, whether it's for new development or solar array, that might be a better way to go. Say that again. So, in other words, if we're saying we're we're out to protect trees, you know, and that we want to set you know a set in um, have um, something in place that's going to protect a certain stand of trees, um, and whatever the number is, whether it's, you know, I'm just, I'm going to use acres instead because I, I don't understand the other one so well. So let's say it's an acre of land that we, we want to set it at that. Um, that if, if we have it uniform for, you know, saying that we're protecting an acre of trees, whether it's for solar arrays, development, whatever, that would be a better way to go. 
So you're going to restrict the ability to cut trees for any particular use? Well, I, I'm just surprised that I, I could, I, you know, I could, you know, buy two acres and clear cut. I mean, I'm really surprised at that. Clear cut an acre? I mean, I don't know how much you're going to be able to clear cut because you, if you get to 25,000 board feet, you're going to need a cutting plant. Whatever that, whatever so the area really, that is. I mean, we're we're operating in a sort of a, in a lot of unknown. And we're trying to do the best we can to come up with a, a standard that that we can apply. Right. And you know, generally, um, in other contexts, when I'm reading or I'm thinking about solar ordinances and bylaws, um, it's about permitting solar while protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the the populace and it's not all about trees because as i said before it's more about agricultural land than it is about forested land in most other communities this is the first time i've ever been through this where i've ever even i i haven't seen any bylaws or ordinances that that have this much detail on cutting trees and i really haven't experienced any solar projects that cut this kind of this, you know Thanks. acreage you know, you, you, may, you may have been dealing with the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, Alan, and as those, those parcels of really easy pickable farmlands are, are used up, tree, uh, cheap, cheap forested land is the next great frontier. It is happening. North I Adams. I don't doubt it. I'm yeah. just saying that this is not something that I've, I've dealt with, that I've seen other ordinances, bylaws, you know, um, address. And so we're, we, are, we are in the frontier here. As, as Lily said, because we really haven't gotten to the huge forested areas being cut down for solar projects. As, as I said, it's been agriculture. I can name two communities, Heath and Buckland, and their ordinances are online, and they they do not permit cutting over a certain number of acres. They outright prohibit yeah. them. You need a you need a hilly town. You need a you know. mm -hmm. so. Any okay. other questions, Councilor? Uh, I I'll have more later, mm -hmm. but thank you. Uh, Sharon, yes. I'm Sharon Moulton and I live at 48 Evergreen Road uh, in Northampton. And I just want to say that I think that it, we should remember what Adele Franks read about the DOER recommendations and, and, and the words were over one acre. So maybe instead of saying one acre, we say over one acre, so it's one point anything. And, and then we can say, and we're following the DLER recommendation. Yes, ma'am. Maureen Carney from South Street, uh, North Hampton. I just wanted to listen to this. Um, what we have, we have. Once we've lost it, we've lost it. It just seems like this is something that we really need to take time with. And I think. For all the people who are spending a lot of their free time as committee members at meetings, this has to be really frustrating. But this is our only chance. And the fact that you talk about all of these rooftops that are available, and nobody's going to want to do it there first because it costs more money. The people that are coming in to get the forests because they're cheap, the forests are going to be gone, and they're going to be someplace else. And this is our town. Mm -hmm. So I just urge that we pull together whatever expertise we have and sort of sit down and sort this out so we've got a plan we can live with as time goes on. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. I count four people who haven't spoken yet. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, my name is Neil Simpai. I live in Northampton here on State Street. Um, I am I'm new to speaking, so I, I appreciate your patience with me as I'm doing this. I also haven't had a chance to read any of the details, so I'm sort of learning as I listen to everyone. Um, I'm an outdoor educator, nature educator, environmental educator, with different titles. So I also think of myself as a generalist. Uh, it means you need to know just enough science to get a certain message across, just enough, um, just enough people skills to get a certain message across. And so my big zoom out view of this is very much um, 
in line with what I heard a number of people say, which is that once our technology only degrades with time, as you mentioned, um, we used to live in a small village in upstate New York, uh, Millerton, New York. My husband was on the village board, and he procured a huge federal grant to put in a 50K array on public land, open public land. It was like just grass being mown. I think that on that, I think that was maybe maybe 10 years ago, on that same 50K array, it, you could probably fit four times as much solar now. And that's how fast the technology is moving. Um, Whereas with trees, we're only understanding that their value is increasing. The more we learn about them, the more we understand about their value to us. Um, and I think it's absolutely true that uh, forested land seems cheap compared to roof installations, um, but that's because we still haven't figured out how to put numbers on the things that trees give us oftentimes. Um, so it just seems like instinctively to me I really, really appreciate that you guys are taking the time to really think about these questions, and it seems instinctively to me that there should be some very um, deep thought given to ever cutting down a tree. And and this is speaking from someone who I swear to you, like stays up at night wondering how we're going to resolve our climate change issues in this crazy timeline we've been given of ten to twelve years. Like I want everybody to have solar panels everywhere. Um, but I don't actually think it makes ecological sense to a generalist that you should cut down a big tree to put up a solar panel. Um, so I just, I thank you and I urge you to keep learning a little bit more before we make decisions and talking a little bit more. Um, I think that's it. Thank, thank you. you very much. Anyone else? Uh, yes, sir. I wasn't going to. Uh, Tony Rose, I'm on the Brian Road boards, um, and I'm with the Climate Action Group, but I, I was just wondering if we could incorporate possibly, uh, we have a lot of really sophisticated mapping tools that identify uh, biologically sensitive areas and, and areas, um, and especially with forests now, that we could apply to uh, our discretion, or maybe over an acre, that it would have to be evaluated in that way and, and be, it'd be um, before it could be um, before it could be cut down. Because a lot of times it's not just the size of the forest or the number of trees, uh, but it, but there's other issues involved that uh, that make it a, a special concern to protect that um, are going to be uh, under under a lot of attack with, with uh, if we have you know, a lot of increase in solar going. So it's just a, just a suggestion as part of a, part of this new process going on. I don't, I don't know if that, that can be added in to, to something like that. Well, currently, I, the reviews are done also, the, the GIS mapping systems indicating slope, um, uh, the topography and other, other features, that's your meta view, and then, then, then there has to be on-the-ground analysis, of course, too, so. Penny, yes. Penny guys, I live in Leeds. I have a totally unrelated question. Okay. I can't tell you what chapter it is because I didn't print it out and bring it, but there's a provision in there that requires setbacks. I mean, this is common in zoning stuff. But I'm wondering whether a group of people who share boundaries could agree that they were going to build up to the back, you know, they could build something collectively and build it without setbacks. That's just my question. I mean, because I live in a situation where you know, there's lots of land that has no frontage with lots of neighbors. And if we were to decide to do something collectively, would that be allowed or would the land be? For, for, for personal a, use for or solar, for? for? For building a solar array. array that perhaps we would share within we that would. neighborhood. Right. A community solar project that was, would, would. No, they would have to set that. You could pool your land, cut off a piece of everybody's land, create a new po parcel, then you'd have to have the setbacks. But, you know, you, you can't not have setbacks because, you know, neighbors agree. Send your question. Answers my question. I don't know how I like it, but I <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's a 
everyone but two. <laughs> I forgot my actual question, but so sure. I got nervous. Sure, what's your question? I, I just, I really appreciate the work that, um, the conservation, and I've been trying to learn more about that and follow that. Um, and I just wonder, is there no way to also, in, you know, I, I understand how much harder it is to incentivize rooftops and on other people's buildings and things like that. But is there no way to incentivize sort of, I don't know, small, smaller, but I, I don't know how if I'm going to make much sense here, but like fitting them into places. Like I see on the sides of highways that, that there's often like small little arrays as you go. Are, is there a way, sort of a similar mapping question that we could find or incentivize those sorts of spaces? Is, has anything been looked into for that? Talk to DOT. <laughs> yeah, that's a. I mean, it's all rights away. So. Those, those are rights away for the you know, Mass Department of Transportation, DOT, or Mass DOT. There are there are incentives in, this, in the community to for rooftop arrays, uh, collective arrays, the um, uh, parking lots. In fact, the city prioritizes those. So, um, but yet, yeah, and and this is actually part of a larger sustainability review. That figure out the best way to promote carbon reduction and also conservation, but also, uh, I mean, we, we, you know, this speaks to the, the essence of the conflict is, is, is the solicitor said we have competing interests and it is in, and a lot of good points are making, uh, have been made today about w which one should be the priority and how, how that priority should be defined. So, but we do, we, uh, as a community, this is actually, this has been our mantra for quite a while, is to be the most responsible and the most thoughtful as we go forward in all these processes with an eye towards uh, make, reducing our impact and at the same time enhancing our ability to thrive as a community and be sustainable. So I mean, that's a lot of flowery words. The point of fact, it's actually built into policy, and that's what we're working on now is trying to create policy, as it's been pointed out. This is, um, with, with, with some exceptions, it's fairly unique about trying to come and develop a criteria to protect uh, the tree canopy and the treescape um, when it comes up against uh, uh, an alternative non-carbon-based, uh, non-fossil fuel energy generation system. And part of the other trick, of course, is and this is where solar ends up with the advantage, is it, it's profitable, mm. right? Yeah. And, and that kind of defines part of the debate. And, and in fact, we don't default towards profitable. We prefer to actually preserve the community in, as being a, 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 a primary interest. But of course, you haven't seen any solar developers come here to speak um, in, in defense of, of their prospects. Now, I believe that they should be allowed to go about their business, but at the same time, I think that I think it's fairly evident so far that hopefully that you've been able to discern that that our um, our priorities are not necessarily aligned with theirs. So, thank you, Councilor. I would move we continue this to our next meeting. I'll second. There's been a motion to continue this hearing to the next meeting because by God, we can't get enough of this. So, uh, <laughs> any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. This hearing will be continued till our next meeting of the legislative matters. And in the interim, uh, it is the hope that the Tree Commission will be able to come to terms with the planning board and we actually yeah. have something that we can suss out. I would much rather, rather this be something to negotiate than a political decision. Right. Yeah, the political decision comes away. Not, not the best way to do this. Okay, thank, thanks everybody. You're welcome to stay for the rest of the agenda if you like. Um, you have several other items. Uh, well, one other item coming up. So, uh, it's about so, bicycle share that. services. <laughs> um, when is your next meeting, Bill? May 13th. May 13th. Yeah. May 13th. Um, 5 o'clock in this room. Is that, is that a Monday? That yes. will be a Tuesday. Is that when it would actually be? Oh. I'm sorry, it is a Monday. What am I saying? Yes. The, yes. Monday, May 13th. Here. And then the next planning board meeting.
so it, it, procedurally, can you help talk me through this? Like, can we just can we talk uh, separately? Uh, separately. Go. Okay. The thirteenth. So that's when we're going to continue this. Next month. Correct. Okay. Great. This year. Yes. Yes. There yeah. will be another discussion in the meeting, in other meetings. Right. As well. So. Okay. Great. Thanks. And. Uh, okay. I will move approval of this put on the floor. Of the, you're talking about the next item? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me, I think we're there. Let me announce the next item. Uh, that's item 19.011. That's an ordinance relative to bicycle share services. And this is referred to legislative matters and the Transportation Parking Commission. Uh, it comes with a positive recommendation from the TPC. And it was reviewed by the Bicycle and Pedestrian Subcommittee of the TPC and amended to add the definition of electric assist scooter. The motion has been made. Is there a second? This is for a recommendation to the council. Yes. Uh, I see the chair of uh, TPC is here, and as per usual, maybe hopefully to abbreviate things. Uh, yeah. So, Nash, you want to come and sit down and speak to your, your proposed amendments and recommendations? Councilor Nash, if you want to <laughs> um, So, Carolyn's actually going to do most of the explaining on this because she understands it much better. But the idea here is that we have Valley Bike Share. And right now, because we don't have anything on the books, it's really not protected. We could have other people come in and pick apart our system and, you know, and, and set up uh, smaller operations that would um, challenge our current the valley bike share system so the idea is that anybody who's going to come in and try to compete they've got to meet these regulations and, and uh, meet our standards so that's the summary thank you for the, and, and, and that and that's why we sent it forward with a positive recommendation thank you. and we're hoping that if the, the detail part that you guys will weigh in here okay right. so Carolyn is that a Thanks, everybody. Good night. Um, so the, we don't have, um, as, as Councilor Nash said, we don't have an um, ordinance. This sort of it does maybe three general things. We don't have any ordinances on the books that specify where you anybody can park a bicycle. I mean, we have bike racks, and we have signposts, and we have all sorts of things that people attach their bikes to. So there's a provision here that says, OK, we now probably should generally define where bikes are should be parked because there's some conflicts that are happening particularly in the core urban area between pedestrian pathways and um and where people are parking their bikes so we want to set some standards so it's clear and then enforceable if necessary so there's one piece of this um uh, batch of ordinances then the other piece the big piece is really about um shared mobility services so that can include that includes the whole range of this um, sort of a um, more recent trend in transportation where um, there might be bike share services there might be um, scooter shares there might be um, any kind of um, service where there's a uh, it's either operated by um, the government entity or private entity coming in and just dumping bikes um, for anybody to sign up and be members and use the bike. So um, this is becoming more of an issue um, in communities, particularly that already have an established bike share program. And we noticed since um, Northampton um, with the rest of the um, region, Pioneer Valley, um, five communities, and UMass started um, Valley Bike last year, there, have been, there has been interest by um, other companies um, Lime, for example, they do bike share and scooter share. Um, Ant Bikes, um, which are um, Boston, they have sort of a, a, a regional presence in the Boston area, have wanted to come into this region and also participate in the shared mobility space. So we felt it was appropriate, and all the other communities um, that are also in the Valley Bike program are also. Um, have introduced ordinances or bylaws, uh, depending on the community, to address this and frame it um, so that um, everyone's operating under the same rules effectively. Originally, when this ordinance was um, sent 
um, out for hearing. Um, TBC um, discussed it. Um, and then the bike, um, bicycle pedestrian subcommittee of the parking, of transportation and parking committee proposed language changes which are in front of you to um, specify that this also covers scooters, <coughs> that scooters and bike share would be allowed in the central business district. Originally, we thought in order to protect the resources that we've sort of put into Valley Bike Share for at least the first five years of operations, and we wanted to make sure that we didn't have any company coming in and cherry picking just the downtown and leaving the other neighborhoods out of it. So um, Bike Ped recommended that we do allow them to operate anywhere Valley Bike Share operates, but they also have to represent the other um, areas that where Valley Bike is so that they can't just come in and, and sort of cannibalize the core area where the where maybe the greatest usage would, would be. Um, and that's particularly um, relevant toward to scooter share because scooters are much smaller trips and um, so really those are more effectively um, or people use them more in core urban areas as opposed to a foreign center or um, you know anywhere in between um, so this defines what shared mobility is and it sets parameters about um, essentially getting permits um, for operating uh, a shared <coughs> mobility program. Um, Alan, you, you, my only concern when I first saw this, and it seems to be addressed, was that it was actually protecting um, one particular mm -hmm. entity that we were subsidizing at the expense of, uh, uh, of someone else, and that, that there was grounds for liability in that. Is well, um, you know, we're we're applying the same rules to everyone. Well, that was my question. So, the, given the fact that that this is universal and applies to everyone, including Valley Bike Share, mm -hmm. that we're not we're not susceptible for attack. I don't think so. Yeah, uh, just a level playing field. Yeah, a, a playing field that is is yet to be defined. Right. So that's okay. So we're just yeah. defining the Define the goal the lines and stuff. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to stay with that sports analogy. The, um, just came back from San Francisco, uh, where scooters are littering the landscape, actually, and, and, and getting a lot of high usage, but being randomly discarded because the scooter systems run completely differently. Right. As you say, you don't have to pick them up at a station. You yeah. pick it up where whatever tree it's leaning on or right. whatever person it's lying on top of. If they if they fall and down and they're not moving, you can take their, their scooter from them and go. <laughs> and it makes it very difficult for um, pedestrian traffic back and forth. This addresses that. It's I, it, and actually, um, and as we start to see alternative forms of energy uh, of energy of, uh, of transportation being more acceptable, which actually this community used to be very resistant to anyone, particularly in the central business district, using anything other than a car. And that was fairly recently, within my uh, my term of office anyway. I'm glad to see that actually this is promoting and at the same time facilitating and addressing points of conflict and allowing people uh, the, uh, at least the assurance or the protection of, of safe passage of the sidewalks without being uh, having to navigate scooters, bikes, or anything else that have to be lying on the ground, including Including, you know, unassisted bikes. So, um, the, kind of yeah. a question: How is the enforcement going to be done of the first section? Is it the police? Is it the parking enforcement officers? Um, well, we um, specifically, um, the mayor did not want to specify at this point um, who, what the, who the entity would be. Um, so it could be it could be police, could be parking, could be DW. So, have the DPW be the enforcement agency? Well, or? maybe not enforcement, but they might be as part of the process of say picking up or yeah, um, if they're if they're rushing to a right. trash can or a bench or something, right. yeah, it might be. Got it. Okay. 
Um, yeah, because there's no there's no fee, there's no fine schedule attached to this. There's no uh, that in the event of a violation, there's no uh, enforcement system. Um, you know. There is, um, particularly in the shared mobility, there's a requirement. Well, first of all, there's a fee, a permit fee for shared mobility right. systems. Um, but if it were just sort of if you left your bike unattended in the wrong place. Um, and it was impounded, you'd have to right. pay to get it out. Okay. But there's no, but as I said, there's no fine schedule. There's right. no, okay. Any other questions? Can we just make a comment? My understanding is that the version that's formally before you is the one that was positively recommended by TPC. There's two versions here in your packet. Yeah. And that's the same version that was referred by the city council to TPC. But I guess if you wanted to accept the um, amendment, by amendments, it would be necessary to we make to a motion them. to accept the amendments as proposed by the parking and the okay. bicycle. Those, 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 those are those that are currently okay. in red. On yes. The, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I looked at the both, and it's the amended one that I made the motion on. Yeah. All right. So I didn't say as amended, but it's the amended one that I thought was what you were presenting here, okay. not the yeah. other one. Is that your understanding as well, Councilor Pine? You did second. Okay. So this is, this version has amended, and it's the last amended version. Actually, should we move to accept the amendments, or do you want to just move as amended? Okay. Yeah. All right. Any uh, Councillor Nash? Uh, this might be helpful. The TPC did not make any amendments in the, the approval uh, of in the um, the <laughs> the document we sent forward. It was the any bike. additions, yeah, um, have been added by the bike and pet. Yeah, that's that's why I understood. That's what it says here in the history. So, okay. so there's no conflicting. It's it's it, it, it's hopped from one committee to the other. But as it hopped, there was no additions from the TPC. One fluid tr transition yeah. into a. Yeah. Okay. And I'm moving the one from the last top. The last top. I believe that's an official that's term. The, that's the yeah. <laughs> but as amended, uh, all those in favor, please, uh, to with a positive recommendation that the City Council please say aye. 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 And there are no opposed and there's no abstentions. So that has moved forward. And we have no new business pending. And uh, I will accept a motion to adjourn. So, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Everybody, thank you.